Patricia, g'day. Great to see you. Great to have you there in Canberra. Before we get to policy, I just want to ask you, what's it like to be there at Parliament House in Canberra at the start of a new government with fresh faces coming in, with people walking in yesterday like Di Lee wearing traditional dress and hearing the uh, maiden speech of people like Sally Situ? Look, it's a really changed environment because of exactly what you say, a new government and a whole lot of new faces. A couple of things, I've seen many lost MPs <laughs> when you first <laughs> enter the parliament and I'm like, I've actually had to help a couple, it's kind of this way. Um, now you're on the right track uh, because this is, this is all new for a lot of people, right? And I think, I actually think that's wonderful. This place is a place of democracy and representation and change is always healthy in terms of not just governments, I'm talking about individuals and and really having uh, new people coming in with fresh ideas, including independents. And the other thing that is really noticeable, Joe, is the greater multicultural diversity. And you mentioned uh, Sally Sutu, but there are many others. Uh, so you do actually notice that. Uh, put it this way, the parliament looks more like uh, the streets of Melbourne and Sydney or Darwin today than it used to. And I think that is a welcome change too. Look, there is a sense of energy in the building because there is a new government, uh, big new agenda, 18 bills that you've been discussing over the last couple of days. And so there is a lot to talk about of substance because of that new agenda. Um, but there's also a sort of shifting of the guard. And so when that happens, change of government also for the previous government and those who remain who are now in opposition, just to getting used to where they're at. And you ask me about uh, the kind of change in the parliament. I'll give you a little little piece of, you know, what happens behind the scenes. Today is the first question time of the Albanese government, the first ever question time, right? And it will look different. Uh, there will be independents being able to ask questions. Like they've had to shift the order to reflect the new democratic outcome of the last election. And over the last couple of days, ministers that I've spoken to have been doing a lot of drills, like practising what they'll be saying and doing in question time. We know Tony Burke and today Chris Bowen speaking to me said it will be less adversarial so they don't want to spend their entire time answering Dorothy Dix as attacking the opposition. But watch that space, Joe, because there will be a temptation to do that. Um, it'll be about how much time they spend on that. Chris Bowen said, you will hear me referring to the previous government's nine years of what he considers inaction on climate change and energy. He said, but it won't be the whole thing. It will yeah. be about our plans. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of really interesting day. I can't wait to go to question time, to be honest, just to see how it looks. I can feel your excitement, Patricia. And speaking of energy, pun intended, where, where is the the climate change bill now? Well, today it'll be tabled, but we know where it's at because both Chris Bowen today and, and the Greens leader yesterday out and about telling us where negotiations are at. Last night, I thought it was a very significant interview of Anthony Albanese's on 7.30 with Sarah Ferguson, where he was very explicit about the fact that he will be not he, uh, capitulating or agreeing to the Greens' demand for a moratorium on both gas and coal um, new projects. That, that idea that that be written into the legislation, it just won't happen. Also, that climate change trigger in this legislation, we won't see that either. These are uh, key demands of the Greens, but interesting language from the Greens leader that it won't be sort of a red line necessarily, that he, he goes into it not issuing alternatives Ultimatums. Now, today we've heard from the government as they table the bill that they are prepared to walk away rather than giving into those demands. That's don't, that's not a mistake, that language, because the signal that they're sending is they're not going to do cosy deals with the Greens. The reason they're saying that is they're rather stung by being uh, being painted as doing a sort of deal over the carbon tax with the Greens. They don't want to be seen to be doing that. Uh, I don't think they want to walk away. The minister has not suggested he wants this not to pass. But realistically, but also... the Greens don't want to walk away either, considering the history of this. Everyone is in a tricky position because of history. Everyone, including the coalition. Under Peter Dutton, they're telling us that they, well, it hasn't gone to the party room, but Peter Dutton has made it clear he doesn't want to vote for the legislation, but there'll be crossing of the floor. Watch that space too. Mm. Like we know Bridget um, Archer. some, Bridget Archer, but there'll be others because they don't want to be seen at the next election when they go to their voters, whether it be the Senate or in lower house seats, 
to be having voted where it will be an expression of their view on reducing uh, emissions and actually contributing positively to the, the world's uh, attempt at reducing climate change and dealing with these, what is increasingly a climate emergency. But you're right, the Greens don't want to look like they're holding up action either, but equally they want to make their point um, that they think it should be more ambitious. So I think they'll probably move amendments in the Senate, uh, but then ultimately vote for the legislation. That's what I believe will happen. Uh, and then they'll still run a very fierce political campaign saying that Labor hasn't gone far enough uh, while still not standing in the way of this bill. OK, now in an hour and a half, the inflation data will come out showing people what they already know about they're paying so much more at the Bowser and the supermarket for everything. Uh, how's the government going to handle this? Well, tomorrow there is a key and important speech by the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, setting out the government's... It's an economic statement um, which, which responds to this specific data. But we, you, you said it beautifully there, Joe. We know because we go to the supermarket, we go to the petrol station, we know how expensive life has got. And, of course, for people on fixed incomes, on welfare payments, on the minimum wage, um, that's not me and you and not some of our viewers, but might be some other viewers, that's actually... That's a really difficult time right now to actually just afford things that aren't discretionary. They're things you must buy. So the government's response will be quite um, important here. The IMF is warning of a global recession. Australia's not out of the woods. Uh, we are obviously in very difficult times. Last year, last year, last night rather, last year, who cares? Last night, Sarah Ferguson questioned the Prime Minister about all of the spending promises that Labor has made and whether they will be reviewed uh, for their inflation pressure. He said he will stick to his promises and deliver his promises. N won't be re-looking at that, but it all depends on what we see, I suppose. Yes, he's, he's made that commitment, but if things are getting this bad, I think that we will see in the October budget um, some responses from the government, inevitably, uh, given what what's happening in this country, which, as I say, is a global thing as well. This is not just Australia standing on its own. OK, uh, great to have a chat to you in Canberra, Patricia, and looking forward to your tweets during question time this afternoon. I will be back tomorrow with all of the what happened. <laughs> Good stuff.